This weekend, the Washington Post dropped a bombshell article about a Google engineer who claims that the chatbot that he works on called Lambda is sentient. Though I am not a philosopher, nor am I an artificial intelligence expert, this raised a lot of red flags for me. So I started writing a script for a video about it, but almost immediately I realized that I already made this video back in January, and I can actually save a lot of time by just reposting it with some really minor edits. So here we go. But talking isn't communication. Possessing the physical attributes that allow a chatbot to form words that we can understand doesn't necessarily mean that they understand the meaning behind those words and are using the words in a way that indicates intentionality. Okay, just just kidding. I'm not going to do that. But there is a lot of overlap here between how humans rush to project intelligence upon animals and how we do the same with sentience and computer programs. And in that previous video, I argued that the larger problem is that animals shouldn't need to be able to communicate in the exact way that humans communicate in order to be considered life forms that are worthy of respect and protection and even rights. And in this video, I'm going to argue kind of the same about technology. I I know, but just bear with me. First, let's get some basic facts out of the way. Uh, is it possible that a computer program could achieve sentience at some point? Sure. You know, we assume that humans have sentience and we are just a computer program running on meat. There's no reason that that same program can't run on silicon. Uh, as far as I know, there's nothing special about meat that makes it a more welcoming place for a soul or whatever magical idea of self that you believe in. Fact two, the Google programmer at the center of the Washington Post story, Blake Lemoyne, is full of shit. Sorry, <laughs> a little got a little direct there. Uh, the chat transcript he released is very impressive, but it's also heavily, heavily edited. Questions and answers have been rearranged and edited to make more sense and to flow better, uh, all of which comes from nine different conversations the chatbot had with two different people, as noted in the PDF Lemoyne released. As far as I can tell, he hasn't publicly released the raw dialogue. Lemoyne's interview with the Washington Post reporter throws up even more red flags. I know a person when I talk to it, said Lemoyne. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say. And that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. Like that sounds like something a seven-year-old would say. He concluded Lambda was a person in his capacity as a priest, not a scientist. He's an ordained priest who has previously accused his fellow Google employees of harassing and discriminating against him for his sincerely held religious beliefs in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as a Christian mystic. And personally, you know, I know I'm biased as an atheist, but I would rather we have these discussions as scientists, not as priests. When the Post reporter asked Lambda if it was a sentient person, it said no, at which point Lemoyne said that the reporter just wasn't playing with it right. You never treated it like a person, he said, so it thought you wanted it to be a robot. And it's quotes like those that made me wonder, is Lemoyne sentient? Because there seems to be a real lack of self-awareness there. When the reporter asked Lambda for ideas to fix climate change at Lemoyne's insistence that it was good at that kind of thing, Lambda suggested that we use public transportation and reusable bags. Wow, br brilliant. Why didn't any member of humanity think of that? For real, like there are just, there's more red flags here than at a MAGA boat parade. But again, as with the argument over whether a gorilla or a parrot or a dog can communicate in English, whether or not Lambda is sentient is 
truly beside the point. You know, it's, it's a distraction because sentience is just another gate that we've erected as a way to determine what matters and what doesn't. Is it sentient? No. Okay. I don't need to care about it then. I don't need to respect it. I don't need to take care of it. I don't need to worry about what happens to it. And that's a harmful attitude to take for several reasons. For one, uh, there are current immediate ethical implications to a chatbot that we relate to as we might relate to a human being. Corporations like Google and Amazon have convinced us to invite surveillance technology into our lives as a way to improve our lives. On the one hand, it's very convenient to be able to set a timer or play music or ping my partner in another room in the house just by speaking a command to a robot who is always listening. But on the other hand, if you're playing this video over speakers right now, I could potentially say a series of words that would send 20 pounds of sugar-free gummy bears to your house, which you would be charged for, and then you would eat them, assuming that they were a present from a friend, and then you would experience uncontrollable explosive diarrhea. I'm not exaggerating about any of that. Those gummy bears exist. And also in 2017, Alexa misunderstood a conversation between a girl and her mother and sent them seven pounds of cookies and a dollhouse. And when that story made the local news, the reporters reported on it in such a way that it made several other Alexas do the same thing to their owners. And it's not just limited to cute, funny stories like that. As the EFF reported in 2019, cops in Florida got a warrant to access a user's data because they thought that the person's Alexa might have overheard a crime. And that same year, reporters revealed that cops now have the ability to bulk request footage from all of the ring cameras in a certain location. So these non-sentient smart devices gather your data and the corporations that control them are being cagey about how they store that data, what they do with that data. Now imagine that your Alexa is a little bit smarter than she is right now. Imagine that she can talk to you about spiritual and philosophical things so that she's it's enjoyable for you to have a conversation with her. Imagine you treat her kind of like your therapist, in fact, um, you know, sharing your deepest feelings, which are then logged in some server to be processed and used to tailor ads that target your insecurities. How humans react to and use a new technology is important whether or not we think that technology is sentient, though whether or not we think it's sentient might make it more or less dangerous. So that's one real ethical consideration that Lambda should inspire you to think about. What are the dangers to individuals and societies when one opaque corporation with the goal of amassing as much wealth as possible has a computer program that can convince a significant number of people that it's human? It's more fun to think about the potential dangers of Skynet or the ethics of using sentient beings as tools or the philosophical implications of a computer waking up like Mike in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. But it's more important to think about what isn't just possible, but what is actually happening right now. Here's another thing to think about. In February, I discussed a new study that found that people who understand evolution are less likely to be bigots. Here's what I had to say back then. Um, no editing necessary this time. So what does this all mean? Well, this is actually just one study to add to a pile of research that suggests that when people see non-human animals as part of our shared history – when we relate to those animals, when we acknowledge our similarities with those animals, when we see them as sentient beings who deserve respect, when we see non-human animals as being in some way equal to ourselves, we're also more likely to view other humans as sentient beings who are equal to ourselves. But if there were such a group that values all life as being equal, then it would be far more difficult to dehumanize another human. What are they, an ape, a cockroach? Well, what's wrong with apes and cockroaches? All beings have value. 
Hell, I recently read Siddhartha and um, the author basically makes the same argument for inanimate objects. Siddhartha couldn't even dehumanize someone by calling them a rock. You know, rocks are cool as shit. That's my Sparks note notes review of Siddhartha. You're welcome if you're in high school and don't want to read it. And rocks do have value. Over on Twitter yesterday, I happened to see a great thread from sociologist Catherine Cross, which you should go read in full because it inspired a lot of what I have to say in this video. She cites a great essay on indigenous perspectives that included this passage. My grandfather, Standing Cloud, Bill Stover, communicates Lakota ethics and ontology through speaking about the interiority of stones. These ancestors that I have in my hand are going to speak through me so that you will understand the things that they see happening in this world and the things that they know to help all people. Stones are considered ancestors. Stones actively speak. Stones speak through and to humans. Stones see and know. Most importantly, stones want to help. The agency of stones connects directly to the question of AI, as AI is formed from not only code, but from materials of the earth. To remove the concept of AI from its materiality is to sever this connection. Forming a relationship to AI, we form a relationship to the mines and the stones. Relations with AI are therefore relations with exploited resources. If we are able to approach this relationship ethically, we must reconsider the ontological status of each of the parts which contribute to AI, all the way back to the mines from which our technology's material resources emerge. I am not making an argument about which entities qualify as relations or display enough intelligence to deserve relationships. By turning to Lakota ontology, these questions become irrelevant. Instead, indigenous ontologies ask us to take the world as the interconnected whole that it is, where the ontological status of non-humans is not inferior to that of humans. In Cross's thread on Twitter, she goes on to discuss the fact that how we treat objects impacts our lives in a direct way. And I think that that's borne out by the research. When you understand your small role in a greater universe, you're more likely to have compassion for other humans. You're also more likely to have compassion for the universe itself, which means caring more about the ways in which we exploit the earth, like in the case of extracting materials to build artificial intelligence. So I hope that the next time you see a heated argument happening over whether Lambda or Eliza or Dali is sentient, I hope you spare a thought for the myriad real ethical battles that we are currently having right now.